I think even higher than our principles, first and foremost, we're trying to be helpful at every moment in the product. If we're not being helpful, then it shouldn't exist in the product or it should be changed as a solution. If that, if there's a workflow that isn't adding value to a, a user, then it shouldn't exist or it should be changed in some way. And then if you go down into our principles, they are really well documented in terms of what we look for. We look for things to be connected and modular so they can be reusable and become familiar throughout the product. We follow fundamentals like pretty well established patterns. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel on every single interaction, just the things that need to be bespoke and invented, but we lean on patterns that are, are familiar to people. And that kind of goes back to the the thing I was talking about earlier. We want to use patterns that are familiar in B2C software as well when they appear in B2B software. So things like profiles and how adding teams and uh, collecting teams into groups, that type of thing. They're really well done patterns from things like social networks. So why would you reinvent them when they, they're obviously performative and familiar to those users? Um, it should feel really personal as well. We, the, the software should feel as if it has been created for you individually and every interaction you have with it is, is aiding your individual account or your individual experience. And then ultimately, like what we ship is what matters, not what we design in Sigma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Growth Mates, the place where we bring inspiring leaders from growth, product, and design to share their experiences with you. Today, we have the pleasure to chat with Tom Bremer, Design Director at Intercom. Tom provided valuable insights into driving high quality design at scale. We dive deep into their design culture and well established design principles. We also talk about how they smartly integrated AI into the Intercom chat and the impact that this is already having in their business. Finally, we also touch on how the company is adopting product growth practices to expand their businesses even more. Without further ado, let's jump into the episode. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, Tom. Welcome to GrowthMate. We are so happy to have you here today. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to join you. Absolutely. Our pleasure to have more guests from the design background uh, working in companies like Intercom. So we are very happy to have you today. And uh, when we were thinking what might be the topics uh, for us to discuss, I think one of them was quite obvious. It's a design-led culture. I think overall Intercom is quite famous uh, for the design-centric culture and also while i was preparing for this episode i was looking at your website so i i think i was very surprised uh, to see one of the sentences that really resonated with me and i think it's like representing your personal mission maybe so i will mention this sentence if you don't mind yeah so you mentioned there that you are a global design leader with over 10 years of experience building world leading products and developing a culture of design as competitive advantage. So the last part of the sentence really resonated with me and I wanted to ask you immediately what is behind that sentence and does it represent your personal mission? So maybe with that you could tell us a bit more of what is driving you these days. It's a great question. So I think a designer's job isn't to just design in the traditional sense of moving pixels or creating product or UI. It's to solve problems, first and foremost. I think everybody works in products there to solve problems. And I think the reason we see companies like Airbnb and Apple and Netflix, like really aspirational products that everybody wants to work on and be associated with, we see those products as aspirational because they use design as a competitive advantage against other competitors in that space. And Great designs, great business. If you can really get down to like the base of everything, um, and design should be a fundamental collaborator. It's part of that, I guess, stool three like a stool with product and engineering. And by having that equal partnership, design's able to bring the voice of the customer, and it's able to advocate for like bolder moves and stronger practices and bigger experimentation uh, in the product work that we do. And the problem is, though, design historically hasn't been at that table and it hasn't been an equal equal partner to product and engineering. And the conversation at the table has been happening for a long time with engineering and product and design's just kind of joining that conversation now. And 
a lot of the the language that's spoken at that table isn't one that resonates often with designers it's the language of the business and it's the language of understanding how that business makes money and the levers that can be pulled to make money and designers in growth are often best set to join that conversation but designers in core product teams not necessarily so i think i'm on a bit of a mission to set up the next generation of designers to be equal strategic partners and to help them rationalize their work in terms of how the business makes money i kid you not but literally like 20 minutes ago i was writing a post that i'm about to publish on linkedin that product-led growth and user experience should be friends not enemies and i noticed some tendency in content and new voices that uh, UX and product-led growth are presented like opposite camps. And sometimes designers historically, as you mentioned, because they were not included in these conversations, they probably feel a little bit isolated and even frustrated about that. And they are trying to speak up right now to get into this conversation, to get into this room. But I also don't think that criticizing the approach of too much user-focused or too much product-led can solve this problem in the industry. So what I'm trying to, to share from my perspective is that anyways, we need to find this balance and we need to find this connection. Uh, and I think that at Intercom, you're also trying to figure this out somehow, how to connect the new trends of product-led growth with your strengths as a design-centric culture. So I think this one is a, is very re interesting and this is the topic we would like to to talk about today, right, Oscar? Yeah, it's actually an excellent point, what you made. Um, and just, I want to jump in as well, because today we had this conversation in at work where someone also was saying like, growth shouldn't be like competition for core teams. Like they, they should like work together, not like have different goals, but kind of same goals. And it resonates a lot with what you to say. So I think maybe this is a hot topic nowadays. Um, I wanted to talk about the design culture at Intercom. Me personally, I heard a lot about it. Um, the, the kind of the design principles. I saw these beautiful designed posters that you did with the different principles. So what brought the team together to put so much emphasis and focus on those design principles? And what did the team achieve after that? So how did this changed the organization, how you guys benefited from, from having them. I want to hear a bit about the story behind it. One of the questions you asked in there is like, how, why am I here? And it is that design like culture is exactly why I'm here. And my, I was in my previous role for nearly eight years. So it was a big leap to, to change after that length of time and to join a company that's in a completely different product space, a completely different team. Uh, massively different location. I was spending a lot of time in the US before with with my team and now the whole of Intercom's product team is based in Europe pretty much. And it is that design-led culture and that aspirational product that I wanted to be a part of. And I'd met some of the key leaders here before. Like I'd seen Paul Adams speak at conferences. I'd seen Des Trainer, one of the founders, speak at conferences. And I'd seen Emmett Connolly, who leads design here, speak as well at leading design uh, a few years before. And Emmett was previously at Google before Intercom and he worked on Android Wear and Google Flights, like really well-designed products. And I think Intercom's up there with the, some of the best designed B2B software in the world. And that is part of why I wanted to be here. And I think Intercom really values the experience deeply of the product. And uh, why should our users, our main users, our customer service agents, they all own iPhones, they all book holidays on Airbnb, they all use Spotify to listen to music on the way to work. Why should the moment they get to work and they start using B2B software, should that experience be really crappy after that? Why should they be putting up with legacy, terrible systems that are really poorly thought out, that are incredibly complex to use and don't have familiarity from one section to another? Why should that experience stop at the moment they walk into that office or they start working for the day? Intercom believes that they can solve that for B2B software and that we can create aspirational software that our users would be familiar with if they were in a B2C environment as well. That really resonates with how the product looks and feels. What are the unique rituals that help you drive this high quality? So how did you guys achieve this, this high quality? What are the secrets behind it? 
yeah um i mean the process is pretty well documented out there the blog intercoms outward kind of content is very um prevalent and i guess some of the rituals aren't necessarily unique anymore a lot of teams have adopted some of those rituals and processes but i guess the amount that we lean into them or the amount that we adhere to them at the scale that we're at now like a thousand person company probably is fairly unique that we're able to still stick to those processes we have like a really clear set of guidelines for making decisions and we optimize for high level autonomy at high level sorry alignment and then low level autonomy that unlocks teams to make decisions on their own so we aren't having gates that we have to go through teams are able to work from problem to solution and shit to uh to prod without having to get kind of sign off from further up the tree um there's really clear accountability between roles like the pm is responsible for the problem space and the designer is really responsible for the solution space and then both come together to assess the impact of the work afterwards from a user perspective and from a business perspective but those, there's really clear lines as to who's accountable for the success of each of those parts, whether it's the right problem to be solved or whether it's the problem solved in the right way uh, is really clearly laid out. And then in terms of our roadmap, we have a pretty strong roadmap in process that looks after three horizons. So like the here and now, the next kind of six weeks is really well thought out. It's really well defined. It has release goals in place. And then as you kind of go out a little bit further than that to sort of three to six months it's more speculative and it's more kind of like problems and opportunities that we think are aligned to our mission and as we go out further beyond that six months it is very much kind of wild speculation as to where we think we should be and as the timeline moves we that becomes clearer and less opaque and uh road mapping happens in that way in hearts and teams are able to put it out there we also i guess this is kind of unusual we publish our roadmap publicly so customers can see what's coming there's a deck that's released every half that is owned by paul adams chief product officer that deck's out there so customers are have a commitment to them as to what's coming and they can get an idea further down the road if they sign up today this is what the product might look like in six months time or within the first year of their subscription and that holds us accountable for for what we're going to release for them but it also helps them understand that we're continually growing and, and shipping the product and and making it better for them. That's amazing. So you guys are giving a lot of ownership to those teams to ship these features that the customers are already waiting for. This made me think about if you guys are releasing something um, and showing to the customers that what you're going to release six months ahead, then that means that the designer and the PM have already agreed on the design solution and, and the customer can have a sense of it. So you guys have a backlog of six months to kind of implement, test, and release. Is that more or less the process? Yeah, in terms of the solution, broad strokes, I guess, agreed that that far out, not kind of high fidelity details of what the solution will look like, but in terms of what the functionality could be for that person, not necessarily how it's implemented. There might be like a, con- we call it a concept car kind of solution. We, we actually call it an interconcept. It's like our uh, internal language for the concept of what that solution might be. There's an intermission, which is the problem statement, and then follows with an interconcept. So that's probably at the level of fidelity that the public roadmap's at, rather than this is the exact workflow and exactly how it'll work. I think yeah. what really uh, resonated with me when you mentioned these alignment processes and these rituals or guidance that you have, and I'm wondering if you have something in particular that really helped your teams reach that alignment. Maybe it it is ham- somehow connected to your principles that you defined. Maybe these principles help you get better alignment. And if you have such an example of a principle or anything else that helps maybe product teams between themselves uh, reach better alignment, I think it would be useful for the audience because it's one of the most frequently asked questions I received from different companies. I think even higher than our principles, first and foremost, we're trying to be helpful every moment in the product if we're not being helpful then it shouldn't exist in the product or it should be changed as a solution if that if there's a workflow that isn't adding value to a a user then it shouldn't exist or it should be changed in some way and then if you go down into our principles they are really well documented in terms of what we look for we look for things to be connected and modular so they can be reusable and become familiar throughout the product we follow fundamentals like pretty well-established patterns we're not looking to reinvent the wheel on every 
single interaction, just the things that need to be bespoke and invented, but we lean on patterns that are, are familiar to people. And that kind of goes back to the the thing I was talking about earlier. We want to use patterns that are familiar in B2C software as well when they appear in B2B software. So things like profiles and how adding teams and uh, collecting teams into groups, that type of thing. They're really well done patterns from things like social networks. So why would you reinvent them when they, they're obviously performative and familiar to those users? Um, it should feel really personal as well. We, the, the software should feel as if it has been created for you individually and every interaction you have with it is is aiding your individual account or your individual experience. And then ultimately, like what we ship is what matters, not what we design in Figma. Like if it's not in the product, I love that. I think it really can support the final check-in with the development team, for example, when uh, we as, as designers from the user experience side trying to ship the best possible experience that is designed in Figma, but the production version is not there yet. And this principle can really foster this alignment. Yeah, wonderful. What do you guys think it helps you have a shared understanding of a quality bar? So what's the quality bar that you guys have at Intercom and how do you share it widely between the whole organization? Yeah, I think that's like almost like the perpetual question for every team, like what is the quality bar, right? And I think it's something we'll be working on. Ultimately, our customers tell us what the quality bar is, right? Like it isn't something that we define ourselves. They define it and um, it's not a fixed thing either. They it's constantly moving your know, customers expectations is changing depending on like the landscape of other software they're using the landscape of like technology changes look at like the ai changes and now there's ai being part of tons of experiences they use on a day-to-day basis so like the quality bar of their expectations is moving all all the time and i think it it helps that we try to connect to prospects or customers at every level and at every discipline all the way up across the company like we push for that customer exposure all the time and we also have like one of the all hands has a customer segment at the start of every week that is led by our rad teams our research and data science team and they bring snippets of the previous week's calls all kind of collected around a similar insight that's been obtained so that's every single person in a thousand person company getting exposure to a customer on a weekly basis and then going lower down, like designers are, are in on research calls, they're talking to customers themselves, uh, looking at kind of research insight docs that are delivered on a weekly basis, but so are engineering as well. And so are, so are products. So every single person is like very connected to the sentiment that a customer has around our product and what quality looks like to them. It feels like the core of this design-led culture is the user centricity. So everybody has access to real customers, real users, their use cases. They see the pains maybe sometimes that they face and they are eager to solve these pains after seeing them, not just getting a task from their manager. And I think this is a secret of any really good product in the end that uh, different roles should have access to this inside to the actual use cases and I think it can be useful for anybody who doesn't have it yet to try it out try to keep it as transparent as possible and keep that connection with users on different levels that's at like every level as well right the way up to our founders and our CEO they still talk to customers on a regular basis like I I'm sitting on three calls this week uh, as a director, which isn't done in every kind of company. And I'm actually going to run my own small research project in the new year that is self-led by me because I want to speak to a very specific cohort of customers about a very specific problem that they're having. And I think you see that repeated all the way across the company, that everybody at every level, no matter what they're doing, is talking to customers. What maybe helped you involve let's say developers into that because i think for product roles like designers and product managers and of course user researchers is super natural to get this access to customers but for engineers like the expectations are usually not there so they don't feel that it's the right use of their time sometimes to get involved into user research so what helped you involve these groups of people who are really building the product to see the customers and use cases yeah so i'm not gonna lie i'm very lucky that our the culture in our engineering chapter is customer centricity and they don't see themselves as code creators they see themselves as creative problem solvers 
and that is i guess where their alignment with product and design comes from and that was one of the cultural attractions for me for Intercom. i spoke to engineering as part of my interview process and we talked about customer centricity and all the way up to kind of vps of engineering and it just exists within the culture of the company it's quite honestly really strange because they want to be involved in like ideation sessions they want to be involved in like crazy eight sketch sessions because they see themselves as solving problems they don't necessarily see themselves as pushing 10 pull requests in a day they're they're looking to solve problems so it is something that i'm super fortunate is just like baked into the culture i think it's existed from day one with some of like the really early engineers at intercom and that's kind of baked into the culture of the engineering chapter that is that is great you're lucky <laughs> it's it takes a lot of time and work and effort to build this culture from early days and there will always be pockets of uh of like different disciplines you don't necessarily see the value or see their role but if the vast majority do then the, there's like a wave across the org that brings customers into every conversation that's happening even if they're like pair coding at the same time like there's i know there's the conversation of the customers in their minds at that time when they're doing that to solving that problem I think we covered this part of design centricity quite well, and I'm very curious to dive into the, I don't want to say the opposite because these two parts should be integrated, but to the other part of this conversation and talk more about your adaptation to the product-led growth motion that is happening right now on the market. And what really resonated to me in Intercom as a company is that you are adapting to new market trends quite fast. So like... For example, AI happened this war- this year and you introduced that and shifted your strategy probably and made a lot of changes. Then product-led growth started appearing as a motion and you started reintroducing it in a new way to your well-established sales-led motion that is working quite well, I suppose, for the company for many years. And we can talk about these two things separately because they both are quite big, the product-led growth and uh, AI. But let's start with the product-led growth. And if you can tell us more about your adaptation to that and what are the biggest pains maybe you observed in Intercom while trying to establish and introduce it at that scale after being successful sales-led company for quite a long time. Where do I start? So one of, <laughs> I guess one of the biggest complaints customers had of Intercom for a long time is our pricing was too expensive and too complex. We've taken a, a real hard look at our pricing and we actually released what we call internally pricing five last week, which is for new customers, which is vastly simple by comparison to our previous pricing models. It's also vastly more affordable than our previous pricing models and more affordable than a lot of our major competitors as well as i'm sure both of you know that is a huge undertaking in itself to be able to release a pricing model for a company that's over a decade old and has a lot of complexity and a lot of different kind of products and verticals and features within that product so that's been a huge effort towards moving towards product like growth but also moving towards a self-serve motion has also been huge so we've kind of actively moved away from allowing customers to have a self-serve experience of intercom over over the last few years and we've 180 that and uh, about six months ago started to release like a trial motion and then a cardless trial motion to allow people to get into the product and then as part of our new pricing allowing people to purchase fully self-serve kind of in the good better and best good and better kind of setup as well and add-ons as well and add like an unlimited number of seats as part of that like a fully as a prospect right now you could fully experience intercom evaluate it for yourself in the product do a trial and then subscribe and expand as well without ever talking to a salesperson or a human which is a huge shift for a company that's actively moved away from that over a period of time and i think we've optimized in the past for shipping a lot of functionality we have a huge platform now that's incredibly powerful but it's also quite complex to get up and running with and that's been one of the biggest challenges and it still is the biggest challenge like we are working actively on our first use experience now and we're just working on a new vision for what our first use experience will look like in 2024 and continuing to iterate on that it's, it hasn't mattered as much in the past with that sales like motion what that first use experience is like 
um, because there's always been a salesperson to hold your hand or there's always been a human involved along the process to get you help you get set up. But now in a fully self-serve world, that first use experience is fundamental to people to be able to evaluate the product and then set up and become activated within the product. And I think the way people buy software has completely changed as well. In my previous company, I was the Figma account holder in my previous company. And I'll be... T- no offense to anybody in Figma, but I did not want a sales call with somebody from Figma because it was the last, like, it was the last meeting I wanted to put on my calendar that was already extremely full. I just wanted to be able to, like, re-up at the end of the month or to add additional seats on my own, and that was really hard to do. And I'm sure that exists for lots of software buyers in lots of different companies of lots of different sizes in lots of different uh, product domains. I think the way that they want to buy software is just changing more towards a self-serve motion. Yeah, thanks for for sharing your your story at Intercom. And I think from the user standpoint, the benefits of product-led growth are quite visible. And not for all the companies, they are like suitable. But for Intercom, it feels like uh, they can fit well your well-established sales-led positioning. What I'm curious about is the actual effect of that shift on your internal team and culture and how the team itself is adapting to that. Because probably the company that is operating with the sales-led approach and have more time for releases and have more clarity for that, have cert- certain mindset that helps them focus on quality, having enough space to focus on these things. But when you introduce the product-led growth, the team need to be more experimental, iterative, and flexible. And I'm wondering... What you noticed, what was most difficult for the team right now to shift the mindset or to adapt while you are introducing this new product led growth approach? Because I think a lot of companies right now are facing this, like the companies that were comfortably working with the established enterprise motion, they are starting introducing the product led growth and they mm, sometimes they probably even don't start because they are afraid of that or sometimes they're struggling to shift the culture in a new way or adapt the culture of the team to think differently. Yeah. I think it's the experimentation point for you, like shipping to gain insights, not necessarily shipping to gain like an increment change in the in the product. And I think that's been quite a learning curve internally for people all levels. Um we we quite literally wrote the book on a beta. Like there is an intercom on running betas book out there so we when we ship something to production we're fairly confident at that point that it is like the right solution for the customer because we've gone through our very well kind of documented alpha and beta process we've released it to smaller groups of customers and we know that that's the right solution when we ship towards our like product like growth motion we're truly shipping as an experiment like we are trying to find out if that's the right thing because one approach for one company may work but you try and replicate that even in the same kind of context, it doesn't necessarily work. So one thing that might work for Zendesk might not work for Intercom customers because all of our prospects are uniquely different and their use of our products are uniquely different. And also the, I guess the way that we produce that functionality is different as well. So there's so many variables that it doesn't necessarily guarantee it's going to work. And that's been an education process that's still ongoing. Like we're working on that onboarding experience right now and, our first two releases didn't get the results that we wanted it to get. Was in release three and four, we're starting to see the results because we learned so much from those two early releases. And but that was a difficult narrative to get across to a lot of people in the company that like we expect failure. I think actually, Kate, you said fifty percent of experiments should fail, like fifty percent get graduated and work. Like that's a really humbling figure, right? For people internally, where we're used to shipping things that work and have a really great impact straight away, and now to the idea that we're throwing things at the wall and hoping some of them stick is very different. Yeah, I can share with you one more principle maybe for you to try out. You have a lot of principles at Intercom, but maybe one more can help you with this growth transition. Is like It's my personal, honestly, principle. It's like optimizing for new learnings. And I think uh, the growth team should operate with that mindset. When you launch something, you're optimizing for new learnings, not necessarily for wins or anything else, especially in the beginning when you are just trying it out. I just wanted to ask if 
all the team is shipping experiments or you have a growth team that is shipping experiments or how, how is this structure inside the organization? For what I heard, it looks like everything that you guys ship is a beta or an experiment, but I was curious to learn. So we have a centralized growth org that reports up into me. And I would say that they're splitting their work into two different themes, experimentation and optimization. Like there is straight up just optimizations for the experience that we can do that we know we can make better and we have super high confidence that by doing them, we will make them better. And then there's truly experiments where we don't really know if they're going to be the right thing and we should push it out there. And then the rest of our product team's working in something like we call core product. And they are releasing new features or new functionality that will often go through like an alpha and a beta process. By the time it gets to a full release, they they are very, very confident that that's the right solution. It's gone through a lot of like user testing, a lot of um, kind of cohort releases, and then out into the wild. Whereas to get statistical significance, we have to push the experiments out in growth to everybody or to a large amount of our traffic very early on. And we don't necessarily know that they are the right approaches. Clear. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love this differentiator between these two things. And I think it helps teams uh, estimate these things differently, approach these things differently. Like what is the optimization? What is experiment? What is a big thing? What is the big ne next release? And I think from the product-led growth perspective, we covered this part as well. And there is another thing that we would like to talk about today is AI and how fast you adapted to this new thing that is everywhere right now. Could you just tell us a bit more about this shift in the strategy and why did you make it this time and what we should anticipate and expect from Intercom in the next year, maybe? Yeah, so I think we were probably pretty fortunate that we already had a team in place focusing on like machine learning uh, for the last few years. And that meant we were very well placed to be able to react to some of the changes and some of the uh, like GPT releases, large, large language model releases. And I guess we're probably still up against the same problems that everybody is. Like the world is moving at a generational speed, like more than we'd ever seen before. And you just look at like the open AI dev day and then you see the things that people are making off the back of that in hours and, and days. And it's mind blowing. Like, like the pace of change is absolutely mind blowing. So we have to be aware that what we're, making today is our understanding of the technology today and i guess a bet on what we think the technology will be in six months 12 months time and, and that's like dual tracking that work for delivering value today but then also experimenting in what we think the future will be to make sure that we aren't left behind and that we stay ahead of the competition and we were able to release thin our ai chatbot um very early after gpt3 came out i think it was and that was because we were already experimenting in that space and we were able to release super fast ahead of any of our competitors. And I think large language models is perfectly suited for customer service. It's like really good at taking large amounts of information and synthesizing it down into a concise, like either summary or answer. It's also really good at having back and forth conversations with people. That's a large proportion of what customer service is. And we think that um, AI will will probably impact customer service at the most in any industry going forward. We think it's just, we're seeing our chatbot get 50% resolution rates by pointing it at your help center. So you have a help center with all your docs in it. So to help customers, we can have our chatbot look at that help center, understand the content from it, and then you can ask it questions and it's getting up to a 50% success rate in answering those questions with no optimization at all. So imagine then being able to optimize on top of that and be able to point it at your previous conversations that human agents have had with customers. And you can imagine those rates could get to 60, 70%. If that's 70% capacity that you've just created for your support team, that's an incredible like value add that they could do with that 70% extra capacity. Imagine being like a premium customer or like a premium customer. They can now focus on like incredible services for those customers because they've just gained all that capacity back. They could be retooled into creating better content to allow pe people to self-serve, to set up software in a better way. Like they've just generated so much time and capacity by having the simple questions answered, like how do I change my password? Where's my delivery? Like that type of thing. Uh, and then beyond that, we think there's a great opportunity to move to like actions. So that chatbot could say, if you say, where's my delivery, it could 
uh, go and get your tracking number. And then you could say, okay, well, I'm not going to be in at that time. Can you send it to a parcel shop for me to collect instead? And it could take action on your behalf. I think that's like the next step, the next frontier there is to be able to have that AI, almost like an assistant or AI concierge do things for you rather than just give you one dimensional information back and forth. It can actually go ahead and do things. And then I guess even beyond that, frontier beyond that, what about if it predicts what you need rather than you having to ask it for things in the future? It can reach out to you proactively and provide service before you even know you need service. That sounds incredible. But whenever I've been using AI, there is um, a little disclaimer on the bottom that says, don't trust AI, like this is still experimental. So how do you handle that? It, it, it is experimental, right? Like we are on the cusp of new technology every single day. And, um, but we think the value that it's giving far outweighs a very small amount of risk that would come from inaccuracy from that. And because we're able to add our own kind of guardrails on top of using an LLM like GPT, we're able to risk, like mitigate significantly on that. And especially when we start talking about allowing it to take actions, those guardrails need to be even stronger and more robust because the damage that could be caused is greater at that point. But I think the value just like 10x outweighs the impact of the fact that it's still developing and getting better all the time. This is interesting. And on this topic of trust, and I know Intercom is very good at user research and I, I'm sure you already run a lot of user research projects on the topic of AI, probably. I'm wondering if you noticed any trends that your end users don't trust AI based assistants as they trusted before, like human assistants. And if you have any advice on how to support users in that situation and how to help them build that trust. Of course, by staying transparent about the AI and all of the experimentational aspect of that, but maybe there is something else that can help us build trust towards AI, but in a healthy and ethical way. There's always going to be people who are skeptical, right? Like the the risk with every new technology, and there's there's going to be a big cohort of people that it's going to take a lot longer for them to become convinced by the power of AI and how to use it, especially in for their business and to talk to their customers and. We think one of the ways to help do that convincing is to help power your team rather than just take your answer straight to your end user. So we're uh, creating a, a piece of functionality um, called Ask Thin, which is going to help our teammates in the inbox to get answers quicker. So rather than the AI sending it direct to the user, it's going to power up the human agent to be able to respond faster and to be able to respond to more by giving you kind of pre made answers that it thinks is the right thing and then you can either accept or deny it and if you deny it you then have an opportunity to give it feedback as to why that isn't the right answer so the model's training at the same time and getting better but it also helps build your confidence that you're able to see the power of what it can do before it's released on your end users with little oversight from humans yeah it sounds like it's a it's a good bridge uh, between like AI and users of the platform and and users of the support I also say imagine 10 years ago, if you said to people that everybody will have a doorbell on the front of their house that has a little camera that points out the street and records everything, people would have said, you're mad, like you're crazy. But all of a sudden, there's like a generational shift towards that's totally normal now. And I think we'll just see that it becomes totally normal eventually for to have these kind of AI assistants baked into everything that we do. And we'll start to see it appear in B2C software more so it becomes part of your everyday life and then you'll feel familiar with that. And it will start to become part of your more business life as well. Yeah, I agree. Actually, we see it. It's already sp- spreading in many softwares that I was using. Now they have the AI button where you can just turn Notion. on AI. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's out there. Like it's starting to become prevalent everywhere. You know, I feel quite curious about where it leads our product world. And I feel good that companies that like Intercom and Notion and other Uh, user-centric companies are using AI and the power of that in a good way. And I think this is why we also started this conversation with this topic of design-led and user-centric culture, because I think this should emphasize the focus on the user and the ethics right now for the other companies in the world 
who are maybe still learning to become user-centric because with the power of AI in hands, unethical things can just scale dramatically and the implications of that can be way more dramatic. And I think it's a good reminder for, for all the companies to use the benefits of AI, but again, getting back to fundamentals as we started today with these design principles, with the usability heuristics, with the UX ethics, with the, all the things we should know when we are building good products. So I think, yeah, it should come all in combination, not in isolation. Yeah, getting back to that, it's got to be helpful too. I feel like there's an opportunity where people just jump on the bandwagon of AI and they introduce AI into my product when it doesn't really add any value, like because it's the cool thing to do right now. And it's almost like an easy sell if you can get it in because everybody should be doing something with AI. The less it's really helping and solving problems, then you're just getting in the way of people and it's just there for show. So I think we need to ensure that we're actually solving problems with this rather than just sprinkling AI on everything because it's the trendy thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe also before we jump to the lightning round of this conversation, I wanted to talk to Tom about one more thing, which is probably not super connected to our well-designed agenda. <laughs> but I noticed that you are also personally talking a lot about mentorship and that this is a part of your probably like leadership approach as well. And I think we talked a lot about the design-led culture, but I think building the culture is another topic and how to build that. It's like, it's the topic about leadership and leadership style and all of these things, which we will probably not have time to touch today. But I wanted to ask you about the mentorship and what value do you find in mentorship uh, and do you use it somehow to support your internal team? Do you use it somehow to support your personal growth and what value can you share with the audience? I'm a huge advocate for mentorship. You're, you're 100% right. Like I've been so fortunate in my career to have had many great mentors, both like formally, but also informally, just people I've been fortunate to be in the room with that have been like in incredibly inspiring leaders and have helped mentor me in my career. And I'm not necessarily the most gifted, naturally gifted designer. Uh, so I've I learned fairly early on that the best way to continue to grow is to surround myself with really talented people and uh, people that are going to help me get better at every part of the discipline, both the craft, but also like soft skills based as well, like how to become a great leader and a manager. And I've worked with a couple of key people, both formally, I guess, in my career, Kat Watkins, who I designed at uh, Etsy and BuzzFeed. Like I've worked with Kat for a while. And then most recently, I've been working with Julia Whitney, who I designed at the BBC for a long time. And Julia's now a full-time leadership coach and She's been working with me for a couple of years, both in a group strand. So she runs groups for design leaders to kind of pair mentorship together, but also one-to-one. -one. She's been helping me for about 18 months now, and they've both hugely helped advance my career. Like, I definitely could say that. Like, um, some of the biggest unlocks that they've had is helping me transition from being like a scaled manager to an actual leader. I think that's what I was thing I was really struggling with at some point. Like, I, I didn't, I couldn't get the force multiplier effect of leadership rather than just kind of being directive management. If you think of like the situational leadership model, I was being super directive all the time and it doesn't scale, but you need to be able to get to that force multiplier at some point. And they really helped unlock that. And I think maybe their objectivity helped because they weren't in the company that I was working for. They didn't understand the context very well. They were able to look at it from a completely objective point of view. I think that's super, that's super helpful. And I guess I just want to give back to people at the same time. So I done a lot of mentorship I both formally I guess through come to mentorship platforms but also informally with people I've worked with in the past that I I still help mentor today I think um I just want to do my bit to set up the next generation of design leaders and to help them have those opportunities that I I was really fortunate to have them at some points in my career this is wonderful and thanks for for doing that and I think you're also supporting the team internally and like if anybody is interested in mentorship i think the design leader and design manager in the organization should support their interest and help them find uh, the mentor because i think it's important also maybe to build in internal connections between designers if there is a, a big team of designers maybe they can benefit from each other from being like not mentors to each other but maybe just uh, design bodies or something like that yeah, do you have anything like that informally or formally inside Intercom? Yeah, so we do like um, 
here to sign roulette where it spins every Monday and you get paired up with a different person. That's in our growth log. We do that as a, a ritual and it helps. We do an hour kind of peer, peer designing together. I think, I actually think everybody at every level could be a mentor to somebody. There's always, no matter what level you are, even if you're kind of midweight designer, just starting out your career, there's always somebody who wants to be where you are. And you just need to find those people. If you're starting out in your career, there's people in education who are wanting to get their first job and you could help them um, formalize what they're doing to get that first job. If you're VP of design, there's people who are senior leaders who want to be a VP of design. There's everything in between. I think everybody has something to give from their experiences and um, from the place they're in today. I think not only mentoring, but having someone outside your company that you can talk to, but that works in tech, it's also, I don't know, if you, have, if you are having a situation with your PM and you're struggling with something, you can, of course, talk to someone within your organization, but having someone mentoring you outside of it that have recent experience with that or have had experiences is also very good. So I totally agree with what you mentioned about um, that no matter what level you are, you can always mentor someone. Yeah, my, my wife calls it my work therapy, my external um, mentorship. Like it, okay. It, it's exactly that sometimes. Just getting an objective point of view can really help unlock something for you. And maybe they're able to ask questions that somebody with too much internal bias can't ask of you because they know the situation too well. This helps you think about it from a completely different perspective. Outside the box. Answering the questions outside the box, but they are quite connected to what we were talking about today, yeah. So these are going to be a few questions. We can make it a bit quick. So first of all, Tom, I would like to know what's been the most inspiring advice or quote that you have ever read or got? Um, so this is a great question. So a leader without any followers is just a person going for a walk. And that's not from any kind of formal thing. That's from the West Wing TV show, which I think there's a lot okay. of leadership lessons could be um, taken from the West Wing. It's quite an old TV show now, but yeah, you've got to bring people along for the journey to truly be a leader, right? You're, otherwise you're just being directive and telling people what to do you're not truly leading people unless they're following you yeah that's a very good one i also see that you have many quotes behind you yes do you have that <laughs> that's written, written in a poster as well wonderful <laughs> we will take a screenshot and put them all to the description yeah then next one a book that can support building the culture of design this is also a really great question. So I, I, I am a bit of a prolific reader, so I've read a, a lot of books and I guess that comes back to being not naturally gifted as a designer. So I took to reading a lot. Um, Design of Business by Roger Martin, quite an old book. It's probably a decade old now. Um, Change by Design, Tim Brown, again, really old book, but some of the old ones are the best ones. Um, no Rules Rules by Reed Hastings by the Netflix culture. That thing, that's a very popular one for people. I think it all help you become a better leader and to instill like, the culture of design. Fun team ritual that supported your design culture. Some some of my team probably don't think this is fun, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, so Intercom has a culture of goal setting on a weekly basis. I think it's it's the best thing that I have ever experienced. In my, when I first joined, I was like, holy crap, that's it's quite intense. But the accountability, like the personal accountability you have to defining what you're going to achieve in a week is unbelievable i would never give it up now and all the goals are published publicly and people hold themselves accountable to it and it is it's truly like unlocking as a process to really think hard about what you're going to try and achieve that week and what you're not going to try and achieve and is that happening every week yes every single every week every single person in the company sets weekly goals this is a very, very fun ritual, and I love this public accountability as a principle or as a value or something like cultural in intercom. Maybe <laughs> for people who are publicly active, they can publish them on LinkedIn and keep it like super publicly visible and uh, like keep themselves accountable for for these goals. Why not? Yeah, some some people like publish it in different ways, and we will post them in Slack as part of a stand up. One of my reports sends an email every Monday morning to all of their peers and to me as, as a manager with her goals on for the week and also like a rag status of what she did last week, whether she actually achieved her previous week goals. I think that's an amazing thing to do because it is like a really great self-reflection that, look, I didn't do that and maybe I tried to take on too much or maybe there was a blocker that I should have talked to me about as a manager to try and get that removed. Like that's the accountability level is just unbelievable. Yeah, cool. Then it seems we got to an end. Um, last, I would like to ask you, Tom, 
where can folks find you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, pro- probably LinkedIn is best. I'm not much of a tweeter or exer, whatever it's, I guess you would call it now these days, but I may- I'm i mainly just there for the reading, to be honest, like consume rather than post that much. But yeah, I guess find me on LinkedIn, feel free to add me. I'm more than happy to always take a connection, have a chat. And then, yeah, I guess if you want to work with me, um, Meander, a mentorship platform is, I live on there as well. So yeah, feel always feel free to drop me an email or um, a message. Okay. I'm sure someone will do from our audience. And anything else you would like to add for the audience, no, for I'm, everyone? I'm just super thankful for the two of you for doing this as well and to to bring leaders to out there and to create a platform for people to share their experiences. I think it's um it's a really great thing for the design community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We are we are uh, lucky to have you as a guest and uh, looking forward to sharing it with the community. Yeah. Yeah. I hope this 100%. inspires others as well, not only us. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, Tom. you so much. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. If you found it valuable, you can support Growth Mates by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues. Subscribe to our show on your favorite platforms and get all episodes to your inbox by subscribing to kitsuma.substack.com. Let's keep growing together.